Okay, so this lecture is going to be on population genetics and natural selection, and of course, um, how they are connected. I uh, first wanted to briefly go over the main principles that Darwin um, stated as he um, pr first put forth his theory of natural uh, theory of evolution by natural selection. The first is that organisms beget like organisms, so you can't. You know, a cow, cow can't give birth to a dog or whatever. That there is this kind, this species, speciation, which occurs, and you can't really cross that. Second is there are no chance, there are chance variations between individuals of which, some of which are heritable. Now, Darwin didn't know, you know, how to fully define this, but he did know that there was something being inherited from one generation to the other, and that as you inherited these traits, there was a chance you could have a variety of different types. Um, more offspring are produced than can be sustained by the environment, so this was something that was um, he thought of as he pondered the essay by uh, Malthus, the economist, um, who also noticed that uh, this phenomenon in humans, there were lots of humans born, but not all of them survived. Uh, the fourth, some individuals, because of their traits, have a higher chance of surviving and reproducing than other individuals in the same population. So some are more fit, more able to uh, survive, and also reproduce. This leads to adaptation of species to their environments. Now, Darwin took a lot of heat. It was very, um, you know, very controversial when he came out with this theory. But one thing he struggled with was how to come up with the mechanism of heritability. So how were th traits inherited? But uh, Gregor Mendel was the one who then discovered this idea of genes and genetics. And he used pea plants to um, talk about dominance and recessive traits and was able to experimentally show <coughs> the probabilities um, and work them out as according um, to inheritance patterns as opposed to just randomness. Um, traits or alleles uh, were shown to be inherited by dominant recessive plant patterns, so those Mendelian genetics. Now with genes you have a physical expression, right, and that's uh, called a phenotype. Um, but not all phenotypes are specifically genes. Um, there are environmental factors which also will affect which genes are expressed. So uh, phenotypic plasticity is the variation in the expression of a trait not due to the genes present, but instead due to the environment. So common guard experiments then are used to tease out the differences between genotype and phenotype, essentially testing for phenotypic plastic plasticity. Um, with these experiments, you can find different ecotypes, which show then distinct genetic populations within a species. Um, and to determine these species types or ecotypes, you need to use data on well, lots of data is available, but morphology and DNA testing is most commonly used. So the example given in the book um, was of three different ecotypes of P. glandulosa, which was a plant that grew, grew in three different elevations. What they did was took plants from the different elevations and then raised them in different um, raised them in different elevations. So they took some from the lower elevation and put them at the midland elevation and the alpine elevation. Um, and so they were all grown under all different conditions and they found that um, uh, they found differences in plasticity in the different populations. So basically you had three different ecotypes. Um, and generally they found that the um, the specific areas in which they were 
grown or naturally grew um, gave them an advantage in their specific um, in their specific uh, environment. So then, uh, population genetics is the study of patterns of genetics within populations. Okay, just kind of self-explanatory. Explanatory. Um, and evolution then is also defined as a change in allele frequencies over time. So many, what uh, population genetics usually does is they find individuals, um, they mark them, they uh, keep track of their survival and reproduction with new DNA te techniques. They can find uh, who belongs, uh, you know, what progeny belong to what, what mother and father. Um, and then over time, over generations, they can see, you know, who had the more fit genes and so on and so forth. So um, evolution is also, or sorry, the Hardy-Weinberg principle is something used to test evolution um, or see if evolution is occurring within a population. And it's based on five assumptions. One, that there's random ma mating, there are no mutations, there's a large population size, there's no immigration or emigration, and there's no natural selection. So basically, if all of these things are occurring, then you just have random mating, and there is no selection, there's no evolution occurring. No change in allele frequencies. Now this Hardy-Weinberg principle is represented by two equations. The first, P plus Q equals 1, um, basically is that if you have two alleles for a gene, at one locus. P represents the frequency of allele 1 and Q represents the frequency of allele 2. Now the way you're going to do this is going to count up the alleles. So heterozygotes have one of each allele. Homozygotes have, uh, you know, homozygous dominant, homo homozygous recessive have um, two of each of their alleles respectively. The second half of the equation is P squared plus 2pq plus q squared equals 1. And this is the probability of homozygous dominant um, in p squared. So basically, this is looking at phenotypes. And then you have the probability of homozygous recessive at q squared, and the probability of heterozygous is 2pq. Now you can use these equations then, um, if you have some of the information, let's say you had the probability of a homozygous recessive um, with that and with the p plus q equals 1 um, equation, you could then go in and determine the probabilities of others, assuming no, pop no um, uh, evolution is taking place. All right, so when evolution is occurring, so breaking those assumptions include natural selection, um, and there are different types of natural selection. So you may have stabilizing selection. So generally, um, a trait has a normal distribution. In during stable stabilizing selection, it still has a normal normal solution. Uh, sorry, normal um, normal curve, but the extreme phenotypes have um, lower rates of reproduction. So basically the ones out on the tails are selected against and that causes the um, the curve to be more central. Um, directional selection um, is selection that favors one extreme over the other, other. So then you're moving the curve basically to the right or to the left. Disruptive selection is where both um, of the so no both of the extremes actually have favored in selection and the middle or mean is uh, selected against and so then you start to get two separate uh, means a bimodal distribution and the average is selected against so one thing that is discussed and when you're talking about evolution and traits is the heritability um, and this is defined as the proportion of total phenotypic variation in a trait that is attributable to genetic variants and the equation for it is 
h squared or heritability is equals the genetic variance divided by the phenotypic variance and the phenotypic variance is defined as uh, the genetic variance of the phenotype plus the environmental effects of the phenotype and what this is basically saying we'll talk about more in class but is that um, as genetic variation goes up in a trait it becomes more heritable as um, phenotypic variation increases basically the environmental effects um, that is going to decrease heritability um, so then another another selection event which will um, break the assumptions of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium is genetic drift. And this is just random changes in allele frequency um, due to a small subpopulation being isolated in some way, or maybe even a large quantity of the population being selected against. And two examples of that are include the bottleneck effect and the founder effect. The bottleneck effect is where you have you know, a large population and then somehow usually um, most of the population somehow devastated and then you have a very small population then it increases again uh, that's going to change the allele frequencies founder effect is where a smaller popu population is maybe um, separated from the others maybe it goes uh, off to an island or something and there it begins to reproduce and it's probably going to have different allele frequency 